good. That's fun. Dude, that does not feel great. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel like total mood change right there. That was good. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Well, welcome. Um, how's your week been? It's been good. It's yeah. Been good. Yeah. Sleep um, more. <laughs> um, it was a train wreck, mm -hmm. but I am now in a blouse and it's a Friday mm -hmm. at eleven in the morning. Oh um, yeah. And I had a pop tart, so you know, things are good. <laughs> getting better. They're looking up. Yeah. How was your week? I had, a, like, a long and good and, you know, lots of things happening this week. Um, I moved into my new office space and decorated it, like, over the course of a couple of days while also seeing some people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's been fun. Uh, it's definitely settling in. I'm not, like, you know, you're just not quite comfortable um in the space yet like it doesn't really feel like it's it's mine quite yet mm -hmm. um so that'll take time but i went to nalens uh <laughs> new orleans you know louisiana <laughs> <laughs> uh this past weekend to celebrate my girl vicky shout out if you're listening uh i guess we'll know <laughs> if you say something about this <laughs> <laughs> just kidding just kidding it's a joke <laughs> thank you thank you so today we got uh we got laugh tracks so. that was my week it was great i loved the jazz scene the food was amazing the company was better uh yeah can't beat it honestly look that's like an instagram caption food was great company was better <laughs> hashtag uh, nolens hashtag <laughs> nolens baby <laughs> um yeah so if y'all if anyone gets a chance to go you should i mean yeah not gonna see cool. else okay. um <laughs> yeah so uh, our topic this week i think kind of it's it's different from last week's i know we had ambiguously ended saying that there was going to be an episode two potentially um and i think we have gotten onto something a little bit more our, our speed this week what do you think jen Absolutely. So obviously as therapists, like we're going to want to talk about clinical stuff, but we realize like that's boring. If you want therapy, you're going to go to therapy or maybe you're going to listen to us. You let us know. But rather than giving you a bunch of coping skills, we, we want to actually talk about what's fun for us to talk about, which is like the philosophy and psychology, the fun mm. back and forth. Yeah. And get to use our brains and have fun conversations about like, you know, the why behind a, a lot of stuff. Like why... Do I hate this person? <laughs> Does that I hate them? Um, why do we fight with our siblings and then act like nothing happened? And then they're like, what the heck? Right? So, yeah. yeah. So um, if you haven't guessed it, today we're going to be talking about our attachments, our relationships. So <laughs> our episode is going to be a field guide to navigating attachments. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> uh, <laughs> amazing so where do you want to start like what maybe we should i think for those of us who aren't super familiar maybe a little crash course moment um we're not going to get yeah. really clinical here but like let's just all get on the same page um and as always we will link resources below um for what we're talking about or some you know things that might help you figure out what your attachment is yeah so remember during COVID when um, attachment styles was like a huge thing, not just for like clinicians, but like the mental health, self-help world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to break down what those attachment styles actually are and without examples so that you can yeah. make sense for yourself and figure out what you might be from this brief overview. Cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So just to give a shout out. John Bowlby, 1969. <laughs> My boy. 69. Anyway, he came out with this <laughs> idea. <laughs> he put yeah. it all together for us. Um, it's basically the idea that our, like, the people who we are, like, our first guardians, our caretakers are the ones who we first attach to. And he thought that it shaped our whole life. But we are finding out it doesn't. We find attachments in every single setting that we are in. We attach ourselves to different people. It's pretty yeah. cool. It's pretty cool. Like um, so some of these attachment styles are secure. I'm just going to like read through the list and then maybe we can, you know, do a little bit about each. Does that feel good? 
Yeah, I like that. Cool. Um, so they're secure, resistant, disorganized, avoidant, anxious. Um, there's more that can be blended together. Mm -hmm. uh, found on the incoocur. They call some of these insecure attachments. Like that could be like an umbrella term for them. Um, you might also hear like ambivalent used. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like what do we know about these? Like secure attachment. What does that look like? Yeah, secure attachment is like, I guess we can talk about it from the sense of the adult relationships. Yeah. Instead of like our attachment figures, traditionally they would say it's like the adults in our lives when we're kids. So yeah. presently, a secure attachment for adults is the person in your life or someone, someone's in your life that you trust, that you can be yourself around, you're not fearing judgment. And if you are fearing judgment, it's not because of them. And you look at each other and then you feel safe when you're with each other. Mm. That's how I think of it. Ronnie, do you have anything you want to add? No, I, I love what you added there. I think that is like right on. Um, right on. Right on, dude. <laughs> um, no, I, I – yeah. Um, what should we go over next? What do you think feels organic? Ooh, okay. Um, so I can think – when I go through it, the next one for me is anxious attachment. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. So yeah. that would fall under the umbrella of the insecure attachments if we're, you know, going to put those things apart from each other. Mm -hmm. um, and this style is like adults who are unpredictable and moody. Um, you might find like that there are presenting self-esteem issues or like a like not positive image of themselves maybe they're hard on themselves um they might come across as feeling like inconsistent um in relationships like or like even with themselves follow through stuff like that um what do you like please say more jen i would love yeah, to hear so, it so um i used to have an anxious attachment so this one like mm -hmm. really resonates for me yeah. um and it's the idea that like you are inconsistent with yourself and you are unpredictable, not because you're like, I mean, you also might be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for when you just like jump into doing things and like you don't really think about it. Impulsive. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you could be an impulsive person. It's like unpredictable, whatever. But really like you're unpredictable because you're so like it's your self-worth. Mm, yeah. In the mix. Yeah. yeah. So you don't like you something will happen. You're like, oh, I can't do it. And you just like stop trying. Um, or you get really anxious that you're going to fail. You're going to mess it up. So you have like these judgments on yourself. And then that's why these people are moody. That's why we get moody because like we're already feeling down on ourselves and then something's going to happen and we're just going to feel even more anxious about it. Yeah. And like coming into that, there might be different stories that we're holding. So like fear of failure, like what does failure mean about you? Like what's like, what are you holding? Like what happens if you fail? Um, and like, again, that circles back and can mean that like you suck or you're bad at things or, you know, we all sometimes might have like a specific narrative that runs through our brain and it might sound different than what I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. um, but true nonetheless. Like, for you, like, that's your, not true, like, it's as it's truth, but, like, you're experiencing well, that's the, well, it. that's the whole thing, right, with attachments. It, like, it, it sets the precedent of what we're going to expect in our relationship. So it does feel like truth until you challenge it, until you allow yourself to experience, witness, yeah. and become part of healthier relationships and connections. Yeah. Yeah. It feels true. Mm -hmm. For sure. And feelings aren't always, like, facts. That's something to remember. No, definitely not. However, that being said, it is a really strong feeling that guides us to trying to figure out how we're feeling, if this person is safe to be around, yeah. Um, yeah. if we're rejected by them, which goes into the next attachment style, like avoidant attachment. Mm, yes. So avoidant. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm trying to like off the top of my head, like switch gears. So like, sorry for the lag. I need like a second to like come into it um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so this would make you someone who isn't able to like verbalize or express their feelings through words 
Um, that maybe maybe like a person when you ask them like what's going on, like I don't know. Um, and that can be a difficulty that can translate into adulthood. Um, and again, not having this kind of ability, you might see again negative self view and low mm-hmm. self worth. Um, which again, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I no, just you're got so good. excited when you said that because yeah. like, we get um, we're like that person's such a jerk. Like, they're just dismissive. Mm-hmm. I don't like them. Like, they don't listen to what I have to say. They're not good at taking feedback. What's actually happening is that they have already, like, a low like a low self-evaluation. Like, they don't think highly of themselves. They have low self-confidence. Um, so they don't really want to hear it. They're not able to take in any more negative feedback because it's just confirming how they feel. And mm-hmm. instead of, like, the anxious person where that's then internalized and it, like, really hurts and they get really nervous about how they're coming off – then turning moody they're going to be dismissive and like shut down and avoid you Mm, yeah which other people again can interpret through their attachment style um and i think again an important term that comes to mind is that confirmation bias so like Mm. it's confirming a bias that we already have about people or about like relationships yeah or about our own self so like again and that's painful when we already have that low Mm self-evaluation. I'm watching Grey's Anatomy right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Alex Karev, how he's always like, yeah, yeah, whatever. That's avoidant. So avoidant. And like his background, he comes from like an abusive household. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was like alcohol. It's been a minute since I watched. Uh, Um, That was an addict. Okay, so yeah, substance use, which is really difficult for both the person who is, you know, in it mm-hmm. their family and friends as well it's very difficult um mm-hmm. you see that in his relationships for sure like yeah. trouble with closeness vulnerability pushing mm-hmm. like those that are close to you away yeah yeah and you know as i'm thinking about it he also like when he gets challenged he this is becoming like a case study on right <laughs> let's um. do it <laughs> Because when he gets challenged by the women in his life, Mm -hmm. he then starts to develop into an ambivalent attachment. Um, When Meredith would just like kind of like yell at him and call him (laughs) out for being a jerk. Or when he like beat up George trying to assert his dominance. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. So it's like. Not cool. Yeah. So like you're feeling good. And then like if someone invalidates or you feel invalidated by someone doing something like for example and this is something that we all can relate to if we're really excited i'm assuming remember i'm coming from the anxious (laughs) background here um you say something to someone and you're excited about it and it's something that you're passionate about so like i recently started crocheting Mm. my boyfriend does not care about me crocheting but if i'm excited to like talk about it i'll like be looking at him and remember the first time i talked about it and i was nervous about it i was waiting for him to look at me and I was, like, nervous that he wouldn't. So for Alex Karev with the ambivalence, he could then take that as a huge rejection. Not yeah. just, like, oh, he doesn't care. It's, like, a, oh, she doesn't fucking care about me. Yeah, she and doesn't like me. Yeah, she hates me. Why do I even try to connect, right? So it's, like, it goes into that This is what always happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It also can look like the adult who doesn't want to enter a new relationship and does what people call self-sabotaging and they yell, they pick fights, right? They do these little things to prove what their idea, their story, their narrative is that I can't trust people, right? So they'll do something to test that trust, to push the boundaries, knowing that like they're probably going to hurt the other person, but they need to do it subconsciously to establish safety. Cool. So Alex Karev. Yeah. um, So he starts out with the avoidant dismissive but then he transitions into the ambivalent attachment which everyone describes Mm. as something different so i actually pulled up google um, beautiful and it's referred to in so many different ways so it's anxious preoccupied ambivalent anxious or it could just be the anxious attachment so there's a lot of different ways to conceptualize it but the whole idea here is that you are lacking in self-esteem so the whole world is going to be like super scary and like not cool and you're going to be wanting to trust it and not knowing how to Mm, yeah okay and that takes us to the last one that i found in my research same yeah disorganized so we i think this is 
I would fall in this category a little bit, or at least this isn't where I was a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, at least in the disorganized anxious attachment. Um, so this is characterized by abuse, neglect, um, when you are very reactive to attachment. So that sometimes can lead to people getting diagnosed as reactive attachment disorder. Um, mm-hmm. We talk Which a little bit. A child is obviously reactive, they're distrustful, defensive, and they're trying to protect themselves. Um, And this can show up in the classroom with other students. Um, You're oftentimes going to see this like in children, I would say, Um, like more adolescent populations. Um, Yeah. Do you have anything to add here? Yeah. I think the, the, your personality development being impaired. Yeah. Because you're so focused on finding and establishing safety that you don't really get to learn who you are, what you like. And that same thing translates into adulthood. Because if you think about it, um, Ronnie, I don't know if you relate to this because you said that you think that you fall under this category as of a few years ago. Um, but like, if you don't remember your childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Or what you do remember isn't like positive. Yeah. So you have these like messages that the world is a scary place. And that compounds into when your brain is developing more when you're a teenager, like your the basis that you do have is the world is scary. So as you're having new experiences, they're fearful experiences because that's the message that you have. And then yeah. into adulthood, you realize, wait a second, I don't know if this is actually true. My fear response seems way out of proportion with what's happening here. Everyone else is fine. We get self-regulate in the groups that we're in. Everyone else is thinks this is fine but I don't think this is fine yeah I think there's also the part of being in relationships that are dangerous and because Mm -hmm. you're repeating that pattern maybe knowingly or unknowingly um surrounding yourself with people who reenact that kind of bonding that you had um and it really can be dangerous so like you might not even have the capacity at sometimes to really be like oh this is an abusive relationship like emotionally yeah, abuse isn't just physical. It can also be very emotional um, in different ways. Um, so with this like disorganized attachment, you're growing up finding yourself unworthy of love. And this does impact your ability to form relationships and express yourself effectively. Yeah. So again, this is a sad, like it is sad um, to know how people develop these attachments like the situations the environment um yeah yeah it is like for example you think a kid's a bully what a jerk or um that guy was so dismissive of me i can't believe he said that it's a lot of times like you have to be accountable for yourself yeah. um, but to be able to think about it from an empathetic standpoint for, with some compassion it's knowing like wow they've experienced something that they needed to have this big of a reaction toward in order to feel safe. Like, yeah. That sucks. Absolutely. Like, and again, like you said, not, not everyone's reading it that way. It's not being yeah. read that way at all. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know about you, but I'm ready to shake off the sad. Yeah. Let's move out of this. That felt a little bit yeah. longer than we thought it would be, but important foundation to lay down. Definitely. Okay, so where do you want to? Where did you want to shake off and move to? Shaking and moving. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so something that I think is really cool about attachment is that every time we enter a new environment, a new group of people, um, we get to form new attachments. It's always going to be fresh and new. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be like a whisper of the past, where maybe. Um, we'll look for someone that is similar to our past attachment style or confirms it. Um, But then we also get to be around new people and realize like, wait, I don't need to feel anxious. I don't need to feel unsafe here. These are genuine people. I like being around these people. I met one of my best friends, Sierra, through softball practice when we were 14. And that was like a space where it w- I felt like really secure because I came into it. It was away from everyone, all of my peers at school, um, yeah. away from all of my family. And it was just a group of teenage girls coming together to play sports and have fun because it was a club team. So we all were there with the same intention. 
Uh, and yeah. that was so safe. That was so much fun and so comfortable. And then I got to be around someone who was also very similar to me personality wise, um, same sense of humor. And that, that was like the best experience for me with my attachments when I was an adolescent. Yeah, no. And that makes so much sense. There's so much choice and agency, like in the ability mm-hmm. to be there or not be there. Um, then you're allowed to like make those attachments with those different people. Yeah. Whereas high school, I wasn't secure. I was super anxious and I didn't want to be there. So you saying agency, that's such a good point. Like I had a choice to go somewhere where I felt safe and that is huge. Yeah. Because a lot of times like these children who might be in like a disorganized attachment, like, you know, experiencing that neglect or, you know, in that um, reactive attachment or the you know, the, the ones that we just mentioned, mm-hmm. they don't get an escape. Like school might be that escape where they're allowed to like act out and they're mm-hmm. safe doing so. So like in that disorganized, the resistant, like those avoidant attachments. Um, think about like being trapped at home, like COVID, um, not being able to leave home and get that break. Yeah, and a huge thing to mention too is it can be really scary to allow yourself to be in what is considered to be a safe place or a quiet place if you're so used to the disorganized life that you have yeah. at home. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Okay, so getting, we're getting back into the sad here, and I think it'd be fun to transition to a little bit more, like, knowledgey stuff. And what I mean by that is, like, the another cool part that I was finding <clears> – <throat> well since I've learned about it was like how cool it is when like little kids learn something we had a professor in undergrad who told us a story about um a kid watching a parent sweeping and then like they can pick up a toy shovel uh they can pick up anything that resembles a stick with something on the end of it and like that's the how they're understanding the memory um like the schema the idea of cleaning equals device that looks like stick with object on bottom, right? Like that's how they're forming different things. Yeah. Um, so like your brain age when you experience new things is what kind of determines how we're going to create these stories and understand these stories. And then that's our background, right? That's our memory entering the new spaces that we're in. Yeah. So like we were talking about this a little bit before, like Jen and I off camera. Um like the stories, the narratives, like is kind of the way that I like to describe it. Cause I think that's pretty accessible for all of us. Um, so like think about like something that happened that made you maybe think that you were bad or that you were, you know, a failure, like some, you know, something that brings up that kind of um, those feelings mm-hmm. in the moment that you're experiencing it now, it's actually like Jen said, the experience of the memory. So like we're in a relationship, we get triggered by something that's happening there. And we think it's the here and now that we're reacting to, but it's actually the remembrance of that othering, um, that other moment in time. And it feels really big and profound because it's touching like a wounded area. Like it's touching a, a schema or a story or something that you believe to be true and it's confirming that at times Mm -hmm. like so say I send my friend a text message or I send them something to check out and weeks and weeks go by and they don't they don't check it they don't look at it I might start to feel like wow like like wow they didn't get it back around to me I, I I must not be that great at friends with them or they must not really maybe they don't really care about it this that or the other and that feels bad like that's not a great story to be subscribing to but it's based in past experiences because that was the relationships that I was in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like when you're applying that to the now, it's like, of course it hurts. It's always painful to, to feel that way. But is it actually accurate to the right now? Like what is this person in the now? Like is this person someone like that? Do I believe them to be like that? Would I continue spending time with them if that's who they were as a person? Um, yeah and that's hard to question it's hard to question those things yeah absolutely so props to you for listening listening to this podcast and wanting to learn more about it 
Um, yeah. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing finger guns, but you can't see me. <laughs> nope. Nope. Invisible. Yep. Uh, so something else too that people ask a lot is why do they stay in that relationship? Just dump them. Get mm. out of there. Or yeah. why, do you still, why do you still talk to that parent? They're a jerk to you. Right? Like questions or your sibling and like questions where it's like, just move on. We have an instinct for attachment as humans. Every animal does. And we don't need to get into like the research behind it. But basically, imagine a monkey hugging its baby monkey. Right? Like that's these are instinctual things across all species where we want to attach to other people. Mm -hmm. And attachment impacts humans so much because the quality of our relationships impacts our functioning so mm, just pause what? there for a second yeah i'll say it again attachment impacts humans because the mm. quality of our relationships impacts our functioning yes 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 and this reminds me of research that i always like to like bring up and obviously i don't remember what it's from but i remember i remember <laughs> reading that i know i know lol <laughs> um women's relationships with other women are predictive factors in their overall mental well-being. Wow. So it is like shown that like when women have, you know, strong friendships and relationships with other women, they're better. Like they feel better, they're doing better, like they have more quality of life versus people who are not in connection that are isolated. Same with like protective factors going to church. You already have like a built-in community usually when you go to some kind of church or synagogue or religious place of being, um, there's people there. Like they, there's people who volunteer because they, they want to connect. Like um, my own parent like volunteers once a week at her church so she can like call Aww. people and just check in on people who don't make it to the physical place anymore. Like they're, they're not well enough to get out of their house. So they call them um, just to say, hey, how are you doing? Do you need any prayer? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So it's like built-in community. And obviously, like, we all find community in different ways. And it's, like, a beautiful thing. Um, mm. But relationships. Like, mm. Yeah. And you're touching on a, a really important piece, too, from Alfred Adler. He's, like, my personal Our boy. Boy. <laughs> But, I mean, he's no longer with us. Um, but homies, nonetheless. He uh, has this idea that – you have to be altruistic in your relationships in order for them to actually improve your yeah. personal functioning. Can you say a little bit more about that? Like define altruistic. <laughs> I actually don't know what that means. I, I like a full definition of it. Um, but I think it means caring about other people and doing like engaging in behaviors that care for your fellow humans. Let's look up the definition. Altruism. The belief in or practice of disinterested or selfless concern for the well-being of others. I would say that I I knew what that word meant. I think I got that one. That's cool. I'm not very good at trivia, so that was a trivia question. Got right. For Jen. And some like other words that are similar to this is like unselfish, selfless, mm -hmm. self-sacrificing, self-denying. And as you hear some of these, you might be like, ooh, like these aren't all neutral words. Um, but compassioned public spirited uh mm -hmm. free handed uh like humanitarian these are all like you know some words that <laughs> that can be likened to that so thank you for taking us on that and defining yeah. it Jen. um one more thing to say about it though is looking at like real world real world application of this sitting yeah. around with your girlfriends and talking crap that's not altruistic Mm. if you're venting that's helpful it feels good but if it's on the basis of like being harmful to other people or looking down on other people that's not going to feel good and it's not going to improve your personal functioning like how easy is it for me to be like oh jen there's something in your eye and forgetting and missing like the huge thing in my own eye it's like i need to take care of my own shit first before mm. i start trying to like talk about what other people need to be doing differently with their lives <laughs> like what I mean, yeah no that's excellent but also there's like people who and like if you're one of them i don't mean offense to you i'm calling you in if you mm. compare if you if you're comparing yourself to other people and saying well i'm fine because this person does that 
and I'm not nearly as bad as them. You're making that comparison for a reason. Your yeah, when you come out, you have a deficit to work on. Mm. And like whenever I hear comparison is coming up, I always remind people that when you compare, you despair um, because you don't feel good when you're doing that. Like like when I hear c- comparison, I'm like you're already – you're like looking at some kind of data and you're making an assessment and it's based off of someone else. And any time that you start outsourcing – you're going to start feeling pretty shitty because you're not going to add up. So, like, there's a time to, like, yeah. You're not going to add up. You're not going to add up. That is – that's a huge statement to make. Can you say more about it? Like, so if I'm to compare myself to Jen, it does a disservice to both of us because there's things about you that are different from me, like things – that are just, you know, inherently unchangeable. Like if we're talking about physicals or, you know, if we're talking about like brain development or just, you know, different things. If I compare myself to you, I'm already giving myself a disservice because I'm outsourcing trying to figure out about me. Um, and like there's – I'm not you. Like we're different people. Um, yeah, and your also – your wants, they're all going to be different than mine. Yeah, so like same thing with you, it gives a disservice because I feel like you're just like if you're trying to make yourself feel better, I feel like that's not nice. And if you're trying to make yourself feel worse, <laughs> that's not great either. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It just feels not good all around. It's like not great energy. Like when I look at my friend, I want to be like, wow, like I'm so proud of them. Like I'm so inspired. They're so cool. Uh, they're so beautiful. Um, and like. That's We're, altruism. Yeah, we all have room to be smart. We all there's enough room for all of us to be beautiful. There's enough room for all of us to be funky and cool and whatever the fuck. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, when you're not gonna add up, it's just to say like you're already losing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like that's and like I the think math there's will not math. The math won't math. Um, and I think you're right about like when you're co- seeing that thing, it's projection. So like, if I'm looking at someone else. And I'm like being like, wow, this, that, and the other. And like you're just like – you know, like sometimes that's projection. And projection is when you think you're looking out a window, but you're actually looking in a mirror. Our relationships are mirrors for us. And that can be both positive and it can be the things that we need to be working on. Mm. Mm. Mic drop, transition sound. That was beautiful. Let me do it. Let me get a little little something in there. (laughs) We're back. (laughs) Kind of coming toward the end here. So I think it's important that we start talking about, okay, like we don't want to compare. Like that doesn't feel Mm -hmm. great. How do I start doing that internal self relational work? Because like our first relationship is with us. So like Jen, you got Mm -hmm. any any curiosities or additions you'd like to say? Oh, yeah. I have so many insights here. This is like my niche area. Yeah, let's get into it. Counseling. I love working on the transitioning to building a secure attachment with yourself. So the big thing is being able to one, recognize, okay, these are where all the issues are coming up for me. I know it's related to my attachments. Um, It's impacting several areas of my life. I'm a really anxious person. I'm feeling very anxious in all my relationships. I'm questioning myself. I'm not taking a leap. I'm not able to be decisive. I'm feeling really lonely because of it. And I'm feeling so shameful, right? You see the cycle Mm. that builds. Yeah, Um, so cyclical. Yeah. And then you say to yourself, okay, I'm done with it. I'm done. Um, I yeah. see more for myself. What can I learn from my past relationships to build new ones? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And then you realize that what you would change is within yourself. So let's fast forward to what to do. First thing to work on is being consistent with yourself so you can learn that you can trust yourself to take care of yourself. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I was listening to an audiobook last night. Um, I will link it in the show notes and she says something along the lines of, I don't like how I'm taking care of myself right now. I know I had a pause. I had literally had to pause the book. Cause I was like, what did you just say? Excuse me? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So do you like how you're taking care of yourself? What would you do differently? And then showing up and actually doing it. So um, a big one would be, I don't like that 
I'm on my phone a lot. Yeah, me too. Yeah, put it down and just see what happens. It can be super uncomfortable. And it's different for everybody. I recommend binaural beats. Oh, yeah. Music, course. dance. Yeah. I get outside, go in nature if I can. Yeah, or pet your dog, have a conversation with another person in the house, call someone, basically just engage with your life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Which goes into the next thing, right? Um, Self-exploration. Identify what your needs are, what your values are, and then live by them, right? Like, you're such a cool person. And a lot of times, like, we don't even allow ourselves to know who we are because we're just, like, tumbling through existence. But, like, allow yourself to have the space to slow down and meet yourself. So, like, what are some small things you can do to meet yourself? Three percenters. We love those. Yeah. Basically learning who you are and what you like and then spending time with yourself doing what you like, doing what's fun for you. So how do you spend time just by yourself? Learning that from what I'm describing here is that... You just meet yourself where you're at. Well, meeting myself where I'm at, which means each moment, what do I need to be doing for myself? Oh, wait. I'm going to be intentional about it and make it fun. I want to be doing these things for myself. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And like, I yeah. think like you said this before, but I think what came to mind when you said trusting yourself to take care of you, mm. I think is also taking care of yourself like you love, your, like someone that you love. Yeah. Like really, like what – Like, so, like, we have ideals that we sometimes put on, like, relationships, like, things that we really yearn for. Yearn. Um, (laughs) And sometimes that's something we can't be outsourcing. We need to seek it internally Mm -hmm. because then it's, like, then that, like, validates that, like, this is a need that can be met. And if you want it still externally, it's, like, that's when you can start making changes with the people around you like if i'm like really wanting verbal affirmation i need to start giving that to myself you know that's such a good point being able to actually stop and say what can i do to take care of myself do i like how i'm taking care of myself yeah honestly it's a privilege i feel very fortunate to be where i'm at in my life with enough gentleness and the choice to be able to slow down and not have anything calling me besides my puppy yeah um so it's going to look a lot different for everyone. And the, the last thing here for building a healthy attachment with yourself yeah, might be the hardest. Mm. Self-respect. Ooh, yeah. I didn't respect myself enough. I didn't respect my voice enough to mm-hmm. use it. Right. So I, like, I, I didn't respect my voice enough to listen to it either. It took me a long time to realize who I was why I was so uncomfortable in certain places, um, how to get out of those situations. Yeah, trusting trusting yourself, what your gut is telling you. It doesn't have to be blaming yourself. And the thing is, it could be. It could be self-blame and rightfully, rightfully earned if you're disrespecting what your brain and your body are telling you that you need right it becomes it can become glaringly obvious what you have to do for yourself and it feels like you're betraying yourself when you don't mm. follow through and do yeah. it and you get yourself stuck yeah absolutely and that's why it takes time to build this self-trust and this self-relationship like don't anticipate it being like swift it like oh, yeah. slow is fast oh this, Just... took, this took literally like six years for me to do Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. My, my mom has a really cool way of describing it. I think it's an analogy, maybe a metaphor. Uh, again, English language is not my friend. Um, stacking bricks, right? You're building a wall and you have all of these bricks and it goes brick by brick by brick. And you have to inspect each brick. You need to know what your materials are and where to place them. Um, and you need to be intentional about it, right? It's a project. You're building something that you need to be sturdy. Mm. This is, it's going to take a lot of time. It's like if you're Ooh. building the foundation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I love that. With that all being said, that just yeah. feels like the most beautiful like ending yeah. uh, to that little conversation. Yeah. Mm. Oh, this was fun. I love talking about this kind of stuff. Right. Until next time. If you love this episode, maybe you share it with a friend who wants to join us on the trails, take a walk on the wild side. Uh (laughs)
JK, JK. You know, and join us on this journey as we continue to learn, uh, connect, and maybe laugh a little here and there. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, Stay mindful, stay present, and keep exploring the extraordinary world within. And until then, catch you on the trails. Catch you on the trails.